The next speaker on my list here is Ros Biparsi. Uh, he's the head of the Middle East program at the Swedish Institute for International Affairs. Uh, he received his PhD thesis here from Lund University in history about modernity, nationalism, and gender in Iran between the two world wars. And then later on relocated to Paris, where you were a research fellow at the uh, EU Institute for Security Studies. And then returning back to Lund again and uh, being a senior lecturer in human rights and then now based in Stockholm. He's also, I should men mention, a, a board member of the Center for Advanced Middle Eastern Studies. We're very happy about that and look forward to further cooperation in this area. He's also the co-founder of the European Middle East Research Group, uh, a network in Europe. Um, so uh, today you will talk on resilience uh, of unsustainable governance structures in the Middle East. Very topical. So the floor is yours, Rospe. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. It's uh, always intriguing to try and get out of your comfort zone and talk about something else than the past. Um, but since I am a historian, I'm going to have to nitpick with, with the whole thing. So I'm going to start by saying a few things about the very idea that we're trying to predict or at least understand what is to come. And I think uh, with the risk of undermining what I'm going to say myself and everyone else, I apologize in advance. Uh, I think in, in the end, inevitably, what we say here says more about us in the present and how we understand the past than it can possibly say about the actual future that is to come. Now, that can be called comfort. It could also be comforting to know that we might be wrong in a good way uh, in five years' time. Uh, I mean, do remember that two years ago, no one thought about a pandemic. Uh, and, and now, probably everyone is going to project the next pandemic anytime soon, because that's what we all have in front of us. Um, change. There is a... There is a sense, there is a need, perhaps psychologically, to think that change is inevitable. And change is, to some degree, inevitable, because nothing can stay the way it was. But sometimes we long for change, and then we also have a tendency to say, something has to give, something has to change, because this is unbearable, this is uh, uh, indefensible, morally, or, or unsustainable, uh, structurally. And all of that may be true, uh, but I think at the same time, the problem is that it turns out that even the crappiest, most unsustainable systems have a tendency of lingering on much longer than anyone would want to see them do. And I think that's important to keep in mind, that we may find some structural issues, we may find some even objective quantifiable variables to be able to say this has to at some point give up, give in. Uh, but it's probably not going to happen when we want it to happen. It's going to take much longer. So from my point of view, this is not about inflection points or breaking points. I think of human society much more like a sponge. You know, for those of us who do dishes at home often, you have a sponge. And in this case, the sponge has different kinds of density, which means that when you pour water on it, different layers in that sponge is going to be differently good at absorbing and become saturated. And so that's why a society is not going to break down. Different classes are going to be fed up and in a sense give up, but not society as a whole. And I think that's important to keep in mind because when you go and interview people and you ask them, well, just how, pardon my language, just how shitty is your situation? And you're going to get very different answers if you go to the north side of the city or if you go to the south side or if you go to the countryside. And so they're going to give up at different speeds, and they're going to feel fed up at different speeds. So there is not going to be necessarily a breaking point. There's going to be a lot of smaller breaking points. And unless you know where things are breaking, the final breaking will come as a surprise to you. And in some cases, very dramatically, as in Afghanistan right now, you can see what we could call the cascade effect. It was breaking down on many places. It's just that no one wants to see that. And that's called cognitive dissonance. And it's very usual, not only among people in general, but primarily among policymakers. Because they know 
things are going in the wrong direction. It's just that politically, it doesn't make sense for them to actually say it. And as long as they don't say it, and as long as they can pay other people not to say it, they can pretend it's not happening. And then at some point, reality will hit you. Uh, and then you have to come up with new policy papers to explain exactly why this was inevitable, but also not your fault. So, in that sense, the future is something that we constantly remake uh, to kind of fit where we are right now. Afterwards, it becomes clear. And it's, we don't know it while it's happening, and that's what I usually call cognitive jet lag. So it's a jet lag, but it's on a cognitive level. I mean, we are part of it, but we don't understand what we're part of until later. And then, of course, it's very easy to be smart about it. But let's just then take one single quantifiable indicator and see how far we can run with it. So the latest projections I've seen by UNICEF says that the population of the Middle East will go from roughly 500 million at the moment to over 700 in 2050. So that's a 50% increase, roughly speaking. Okay? What does that mean? Well, at the moment, the big problem in the region is governance. Some people would think it's democracy. I beg to differ. I think people tend to think of democracy as an intrinsic value, and we can argue for that, I would agree that it is, but I think people forget that democracy as an historical process is not an intrinsic value. People did not want democracy because it's fun to go and vote. They wanted it because they wanted to achieve something or get a right. And you can either kill people to get it, or you can vote to get it, to put it very simply. Now, if your process does not deliver any of this, then it's the process that you discard, and it delegitimizes the intrinsic value of democracy. So I think what you're seeing in Tunisia, as an example, is exactly that. You have a country that went through probably one of the best, at least, robust developments towards democracy in the Arab Spring, and now it has not necessarily come to an end. I'm a historian, I know you can never say something comes to an end. But it has come to a halt. And it is now regressing. But it's not regressing because people suddenly decided they didn't like democracy. It's because the democratic process, whatever it was at this moment in Tunisia, did not deliver some of the very basic things without which elections are totally irrelevant. Because if you don't have food on the table, if you don't have a job, etc., then you can go and vote until you're blue in the face. It doesn't mean anything. So if you connect these two, you can say that most of the countries in the Middle East really, really suck at governance, and they're very bad at finding jobs for their youth. And they have more and more young people who are getting educations. And getting education means that you get expectations. So the expectation gap is one of the things that are growing and are going to continue to grow because we're talking hundreds of millions of people coming out to a job market that is already beyond dysfunctional in many of these countries. So I think that in and of itself is the singular thing I would, if I were stuck in an elevator for 60 seconds with someone, say this is something to look at. And from that population indicator, you get all the things that the rest of this esteemed panel is going to discuss, water, environment, etc. because more people means a bigger strain on everything that you have and everything you don't have. So that, I think, in and of itself is enough to tell you that there is a huge challenge and it has nothing to do with ideology in that sense. It's not about whether you're for or against democracy as a system, it's much more about your ability to understand what governance entails. Now, in the long run, obviously, a democratic system is more transparent, so it's a better way of maintaining governance, but first you have to actually have governance. And that doesn't necessarily come from just having one or two or three elections. Now, finally, a kind of a two examples that are a bit similar and at the same time very different. Let's say Saudi Arabia and Iran, two countries I've looked at, so I can at least speak somewhat comfortably about them. Here you have two countries that are hydrocarbon-based societies. Okay? Both of them have their main income from hydrocarbon. Both have to make a transition away from that. Both have a youth bulge as it is, like many of the countries in the region do and both are struggling in figuring out how to do it. So this is not 2050, this is now. 
And both are doing it in very different ways based on their very different uh, conditions. Saudi Arabia has money, but hasn't really figured out how to do it because it will require a transformation of society, how people work, where they work, why they work. So the money is there. And God knows there are more than enough American consultants to take that money to tell you how to do it, but they have yet to figure out how to actually do it. In the Iranian case, they have more experience with this, not because they're smarter, but because they have had no choice, because they don't have that money. So they've had to start that transition to a much larger degree than Saudi Arabia has so far. It's just that they don't have the money and the wherewithal to go through with it. And in both cases, they want this to be done top down. And that's the reason why both of them will continue to struggle trying to make this happen, because that's not the way to do it. Also because those who are on the top don't understand their own societies, not nearly as much as they need to in order to help steer those societies into some kind of future. Thank you. Thank you.